Okay, we're live. Hi, everybody. If we, hope I didn't keep you waiting too long. We had sound problems. We still have a little bit. I'm creating problems with the echo, and it's driving everyone else nuts. Um, so hopefully this works out. Uh, so much for hyper personalization, guys. Well, I guess the hyper, cool. the hyper personal. Yeah, it's a personal. It's a very personal echo. So hopefully people aren't too distracted by that. Um, the good news is I'm, you know, obviously I'm obviously not going to try to talk this whole time. I'm going to try to set these guys up. So um, if if you hear an echo a little bit, just know that we did our best. But at some point it's showtime, and now we got to move on. Um, so anyway, um, I want to talk a little bit about buzzwords today, uh, hyper personalization, and the reason we're back to discuss this is because you guys have been talking about this a lot. Your video popped up, Marshall. You're doing a presentation on hyper personalization. I'm like. My buzzword allergy started to flare up a little bit. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. And then, I heard, and then I heard a rumor that Thomas did a video on it. So we're gonna we're gonna get to the bottom of hyper personalization today and see if this buzzword actually carries true merit for customer consideration. How's that? I had a whole presentation for you guys on enterprise buzzword detection, but given my the fact that I'm creating echo problems. I really don't want to waste time with that right now. So we're going to, I'm going to wing it, save my enterprise buzzword detection story for another time. Uh, but uh, so we do need to, before we can kind of debate hyper-personalization, we do need to understand it though. So I'm going to turn it over to Marshall first and then to Thomas, and we're going to try to actually define this elusive, but very marketing friendly term. So, so Marshall, why don't you share a little bit about what you've learned about the world of hyper personalization well uh, if we're going to start with a definition uh, hyper personalization is a way to deliver highly tailored product recommendations to uh, consumers it'd be a good way to look at it it's data driven based on reading what we call a person's uh, digital fingerprints uh, which is uh, the the trail that you leave as you work your way through today's technological society. It's cookies, it is um, data that you put in that you give to businesses that you work with to uh, build a persona for yourself. It is the recommendations that you look for on you know, Netflix or Amazon or whatnot. And it is real time or at least increasingly real time as we're getting more and more technologically proficient. Let me just cut in for one sec. Uh, hi, Tracy. Welcome back. Always good to see you. I'm not sure you mean what you mean about the disruptive transform thing, but uh, I don't know. I, I guess the show can be disruptive. I try not to use that word as far as transformed. I'm definitely a work in progress, so I can't say, can't say we're transformed here. I'm sorry, but I'm glad you're here to help us with that. Marshall, just real quick, why do we need to talk about hyper-personalization? Wasn't personalization sufficient? I think this is one of the cruxes of the matter for me. I think it was, too. <laughs> See, that's the funny thing. All uh, right. Yeah, I mean, we win. Hi personalization was enough. Show's over. Thanks for coming. Now, we needed... Yeah, make it ultra-personalization, please. Yeah, so going beyond hyper into ultra... Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, what it was. Oh, no. no. We got to talk about ultra personalization, too. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Then we'll get into giga personalization for all the giga chads out there. Mm. Oh, my and, lord. Yeah. And then we are Star Trek. Yeah. Then we are warping around. <laughs> yeah. We could bring this back to uh, the old attention economy. Uh, this is kind of where it started. Uh, when there are more businesses uh, clamoring for your attention, something that is targeted directly at you, uh, not only with your name on it, which is personalization, but that meets your emotional interest, that meets uh, your product interest, that meets your... You know, the things that you're looking to do, your attitude, that is going to get you 
more interested in what a business has to offer than something that isn't. Or at least that is the belief that vendors have. It's not wrong. It's probably not as right as... Oh, the Hyper Ultra... Yeah. Ex, yeah. Double Tracy C Webster wrong. has Hyper Ultra Extra Special, special Specialization... That's in That's mind. <laughs> well, now we're going to put them on double secret special. We might be able to turn it into an acronym of some kind, though, like Hus. who? Uh, let's, let's blah, blah. Who's? <laughs> do I need to get my um, BS button going here? Yeah. <laughs> Absolute Go for it. bullshit. Word. No. Uh, I yeah, think well, one of the reasons we've got hyper personalization is because products march on and personalization wasn't enough. It was considered to be too rough that something was only targeted mm -hmm. to your city and not your zip code. Or that it was targeted to people who are interested in a general type of movie or TV show mm -hmm. and not one that is that has like 10 different things that you're interested in as opposed to just a broad overview. There's always this drive mm -hmm. to get deeper and deeper into an individual's pocket because the idea is that it creates a better experience for them. And mm -hmm. we've all in the industry decided that experience is what rules customer interactions. And you can say yes or no to that, but that's where we're at. Yeah, so I think there's been some proven results around personalization in certain contexts, you know, because um, I'm a stickler for like, if we're going to use buzzwords, can we attach some ROI to some of these things? And and with personalization, we've seen some of that, right? Like, you know, we, we see it on Amazon. We know we know that it works. <laughs> we know oh, that yeah. showing showing people, you know, patterns of who who is who else has bought this product, things like that. When I think about a personalization, if I were to define these terms like I might accept personalization as like more of a broader segment that I'm a part of. Whereas I think of, I sort of judge hyper personalization rightly or wrongly as to whether that message is precisely geared to me and was it effective. And my big problem is that when companies try to do this, they trip over themselves so often that it becomes frustrating to me, even if they have the data you know, like, 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 because a lot of times when you look into this, the, the marketers tell you, well, it's not working because there's not enough data. They don't have the data. They need to get more often data. But my experience has been that even the companies that have a hell of a lot of data on me don't do a very good job with this yet. So I, I, I find myself wondering if this is worth it because I don't know about you all, but I get very alienated when someone tries to hyper personalize something for me and totally fails. It, it actually makes them look more tone deaf. Whereas if they had just stuck with a general segment, I think it would have worked a lot better. You know, like, like so for, for example, today in the mail, I got a thing for one of my credit cards. It was like, oh, activate for a reduced rate. They didn't try to say like, hey, John, we noticed you've been buying this or that and you're going to want to buy a hibachi grill this summer or whatever. Like they just stuck with like a generalized offer they thought I might be interested in. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But if they had tried to do something more specific, they would have fell on their face and irritated me. And I think to me, that's sort of the question is like, how do we, I'm not going to deny that hyperpersonalization hyper -personalization could work, but it seems like a long journey, right? Because like, I was just thinking about my Alexa devices. I've had them for four years. I don't think I have had a single time when my device actually proposed something for me like on, on their side, like, hey, you might like this, that actually work. And they have so much data. I mean, they're listening to me right now. They're listening to me all the time. Like, they so you think, think they'd get it right. Mm. You would think that. Um, but you still run into situations um, like every holiday season, mm. you're going to be buying gifts for people, as, mm. assuming you're not a complete recluse like I am. And then having bought those gifts, say your 80 year old retiree down in Florida buying stuff for your grandkids. And yes, I know that's a stereotype, but go with me here. You buy a bunch of uh, Xbox games and PlayStation games for your kids. 
you know, shooters, flight simulators, whatever it is they play. Having bought those as gifts, those irrelevantly personalized things are going to show up as recommendations for you. Mm. you know, hey, old man Henderson, would you like to buy the you know Call of Duty 12 or you know Grand Theft Auto 96? You know the return of Grand Theft Auto. These games were never for you in the first place, but because mm. you stuck your credit card information in mm. and bought them from a particular retailer, now everyone thinks this is what you want. We all had that experience where you know you just go looking for some clothing online, or even better, you buy some buy a piece of furniture that you needed. And for the next three months, you're getting ads for the same piece of furniture. How many times do I need a couch? You know, yes, you've personalized my ads successfully. You've also pissed me off because you aren't understanding my needs. You're just trying to climb into my pocket. That's the main problem, right? So there are two problems actually with it. One is they are working on the wrong data. They're working on outdated data often. And the second is that they are having the wrong interest in mind. So I can I can run with the granddad who gets the ad for his grandchild because granddad every year buys <laughs> this game for <laughs> the grandkid, but in general, what they are doing is they are building treasure troves of what Ralph usually calls smelly stuff. So of data that gets older. How did you name it? Sours like milk, right? <laughs> in yeah, another it, context. It, yeah. it ages like and, milk, not like wine. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. So and instead of using more in moment data, which would help in personalization. Because if you're in moment in context, along with the real time abilities that we have now, then you actually can serve up some information that I actually want. If you want yes. to serve it up for me. Yes, I think you're onto something exactly right now when you both emphasize the real time aspect. But I want to juxtapose that with what Tracy said. Oh, by the way, she, you made her laugh out loud, Marsha, with the Grand Theft Auto example. I am very happy to provide um, laughs. Tracy says, am I just old? I don't like it when technology serves up something I've he it heard and it discerns I need, like when Facebook shows something in your feed after I just talked about it, even though they aren't listening, I find it creepy. And and so I think the real-time factor has to be juxtaposed against the creepy factor. Yeah. To give you one quick example of that, I was searching on eBay for these shirts I wasn't able to find locally. It's not a it's kind of a stupid thing. It's like a Hanes undershirt. It's not like get a little personal here, I guess. But anyhow, is it hyper whole, personal? It is high, kind of hyper personal. <laughs> but uh, so I do the search on Google, and um, thirty minutes later, I get the first relevant personalized YouTube ad I've gotten in about a year of watching YouTube, which is an ad for T-shirts airing before the video. But so that was to your point. That was real time, and it's not quite as creepy because it's still on the Google platform, right? It's still a Google property, so it's not like there was some data exchange between third parties. But it still gave me the creeps a little bit. You know, it, it's funny. It's like, I know Google has all my data all the time anyway, but it bothers me a little bit. So I think there's that interesting tension because you're right. It did sort of strike me because I was like, yeah, I do need t-shirts. But then I was also like, what the fuck? Like, I think we need to dis distinguish a bit between ad tech and martech here. So what you're talking about is advertisement, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. The real time personalization in my eyes happens best if you are sticking to the, the marketing stuff. So staying on premise of that side yeah. and serving me information, not advertisements, information content that is relevant to me and not that is relevant to them selling a bit more of something that I may or may not want. So th there we are a bit in the area of journey orchestration, journey analytics as well. But we, we really should get out of the, the ad tech market there. So ad tech isn't just it. I mean, we, we all can come up with right. dozens of stories. 
My best one is when I purchased this microphone I'm just speaking into. Of course I researched it on Google. Then I went to some Amazon reviews. And then I went to the manufacturer site and bought it right there. The day after, the day after, reading an online newspaper, I got 13 of 16 advertisement slots filled from one vendor, well, from one retailer, filled with ads for this very microphone. Tad late. Sorry for them. They spent probably 50 bucks or 100 bucks on advertisements that got served to me. So, ah, oh, hi, Irid. By the way, I just talked to Irid just before this. Hey, Irid, how you doing? Thanks for joining. Yeah. We'll get back to your comment. I, I, w I was, she asked me to convey best regards to you. Oh, he, thank you. Publicly done here with. <laughs> publicly done, okay. So the echo is still kind of annoying. Sorry about that, folks. But um, I think I do need to go through, and, and I want to present this to you. I did this through an emerging enterprise no-code solution that you should all keep an eye out. It's called a Sharpie pen. <laughs> <laughs> so look out for that. You'll probably hear from that soon. Your next enterprise keynote is the enterprise buzzword deconstruction. My, I, I spent a lot of hours preparing this for you. Um, the, the top of it is, is it new? Um, and, and so an example of that would be like uh, low code itself, there's been rapid, rapid application development tools for a long time. So we first have to ask, is it new? I think in the case of hyper personalization, we can make the argument that to some extent it is because it's relying on some real time technologies that probably weren't available to us 10 or 20 years ago. Anyway, hold your thought, Thomas. And the next one is, it, the, next, the next one is, is it necessary? So in other words, do we need this term? So that gets back to personalization, right? So I'm not sure if we've clearly established during this program whether we need terms beyond personalization or not, whether we need ultra personalization, hyper personalization. So we need, I think we need to, you know, go back to that a little bit as far as what terms do we actually need. Is it accurate? That's number three there. So it does it accurately describe what we're talking about. So for example, I don't want to get into a metaverse discussion, but I would argue that the metaverse is not an accurate term. Because if it does come to pass, it's going to be a multiverse, not a metaverse. There's, we're not going to be all you, hanging Dr. out. Strange. We're not going to be, yeah, there you go. We're not going to be hanging out. Um, the next one is what the hell or definition. So in other words, like, how are we going to actually define this term? Which I think we, we did a pretty good job of with Marshall. Mm -hmm. Then is it relevant? Is there ROI attached to it? Are there viable use cases? I think those, those are really important points to me. Let's get specific on those use cases. I think Thomas made a really important distinction between sales and you know e-commerce per se versus marketing. So that's a really important point as far as which use cases may be most viable. Do customers use it? Um, and that's kind of a two-parter. Do customers use it? And do they actually use the friggin' word? Right? So, you know, like... Should we should we stick with plain English when we talk to customers, or are they actually using the term themselves? So well, I, you think of a word enterprise like enterprise customers or consumers. Well, we have an enterprise audience here, so let's stick with that. Um, so, um, so in other words, like a word like leverage, yeah, you, you, you might just be able to use the word use in most cases. Um, and then the final one is: is it an overreach? Uh, in other words, does the buzzword try to accomplish too much? And so, so that's my little buzzword deconstruction game. Um, and I think it's worth considering a few of those points. And, you know, so for, for example, with overreach, with Metaverse, for example, one thing that bothers me the most about Metaverse hand waivers like Accenture, sorry Accenture, but you do it, is lumping things like digital twins, which have been around for a long time, into an umbrella term like metaverse to give it credibility. To me, that's an overreach because it already exists, right? So I think thinking about it in these ways, and this is not a definitive guide, this is back the napkin stuff. My no code wasn't completely finished at airtime. I think thinking about it, thinking about it in this context, I think helps us to kind of think about why are we using this word in the first place? So you guys both had comments on that. So let's hear your comments. 
Thomas, you were the one that got cut off first. So yeah, let's see. You, you got cut off. off. You got cut off around. Is it necessary? I think you were hung up on that one, right? So as as a word, there's only one audience that, or one group of people who I can can think of that deem the word necessary, and these are the marketers of such tools. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, right. the, 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 the old, the, for all the yeah. other ones this is um goes right. to the bingo stuff yeah so, yeah right so this we, we do have the correct answer there thomas excellent uh yes. the marketers the marketers feel it's appropriate uh yeah. but that's not going to be good enough for, that's not good enough for our discussion today so we are we are, we are, run, we are running out of prefixes to words we, can, we are. came from super mega giga hyper ultra perhaps yeah. and whatever so the, the only group that needs it is the ones who want to sell this stuff whatever stuff this is talk about hyper automation yeah same thing mic right. drop well what <laughs> my mic marshall so, you had a comment marshall you had a comment on on one of these as well i'm not sure which one but uh, probably a few of them. Um, I may as well start with new. Um, Hyper-personalization or some degree of personalization beyond the basic isn't new. Uh, it was a topic when I first started covering CRM stuff back in the mid-2000s. Mm. It was, I mean, mm. don't get me wrong, it wasn't at the level that we're talking about now. But it was there, and even at that point, we were talking about that uh, the creepy factor of being too personal with a customer uh, too soon or about the wrong topic. Uh, there was a famous one. In fact, I, I will blur the details, not only for privacy, but because I don't really remember them, uh, of... <laughs> A parent who found out that his daughter was pregnant because of ads he was receiving from a local pharmacy. Mm -hmm. You know, congratulations, you know, we know that your event is coming. Here are some diapers and, uh, you know, formula coupons and whatnot. And he had no idea why he was getting them. It was because the daughter had, uh, well, bought some pregnancy tests and discovered she did not like the results. This and, is a hyper-personal you know, conversation, I think. Yeah, this is it is. Yeah. This is excellent. It sounds, you were, you it were right really on point. In, yeah, really inappropriate, right? But uh, Not on my was, show, thankfully, but otherwise, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, but things like that, where yeah, it's personal and personalized, but it might not actually be personalized for you mm. because sometimes there are more than one person using an account you know mm. it, it was there then it's there now <clears throat> it's just stronger now yeah. the concept is there for ages i mean in the 80s we called it one-to-one -one marketing just we didn't have the technology to really become one-to-one -one because it yeah. didn't scale right, right. Yeah. Hmm. poor peppers and rogers they were ahead right. of their yeah. time yeah Right. So in some ways it's not new, but I do think that when you want to talk about real time, there is an argument that it's time has come, whatever you want to call it, that, that at least some of the technology allows it to happen. Um, you know, I, to me, where I land on this is if you want to attach personalization to exposing segmented groups with similar information. So in other words, like I see certain things on Netflix, but I'm in like a group that sees some more things. If you want to say that's personalization, then then the goal to try to show every single individual something different, I can see an argument for a new word for that, but um, or a way to distinguish. But you could also just say that the first one is segmentation, and the second and <laughs> and personalization is the other one. Mm. So as long as there's two words, it doesn't really matter to me what the hell they are. I guess it's kind of boring to talk about segmentation versus personalization. It's more sexy to talk about personalization, hyper-personalization, ultra. Right. Yeah, okay. But to me, those are the big distinctions, right? It's like 
taking, you know, showing a group of people who might have interest some something versus showing really trying to show each and every person something different. Though that's that's what we're talking about in a nutshell. What however you want to call it, I really don't care. That's different but, levels of filter. Are we in agreement on that that part? Like whatever we want to we haven't necessarily agreed on the terms, but like do you agree that there's a distinction there between showing a group of people something versus an individual? I think we're there. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah. Then we are there. So we, okay. we might not. We might not like the word, but that's fine. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily saying that hyperpersonalization is the proper word for that, but I think that's. If you want to talk about that, I'm good with that. If you if you're then going to add that there's ultra and stuff, then you start to kind of lose me a little bit. Yeah. Um, Brian, welcome to the show. I'm sorry that hey, your paradigm Brian. shifted. Um, <laughs> that that can be difficult. I know you were driving earlier. I hope you were able to pull over. I mean, um, from a wording point of view, personalization already says it, right? It's not grouping, but personalization. Yeah, I would tend I, I would tend to agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah, how more personal than personal can you get? Right. Uh, it says, uh, it sounds like you all agree that hyper super personalization or whatever we call it would, would have been great, only no one is getting it right. I wonder if B2B being slower would have been more accurate than B2C. So a couple things. I actually, um, I'll, I'm going to save this towards the end of the show because I want Marshall and Thomas to share some tips with us first. But I have a different framework for thinking about what I need from personalization. So for me, I actually, in the, for the most part, I don't want companies to try this on me. I don't want them to try to outsmart themselves with my data, but I may be in the minority there. Um, but the one thing I do want to say is that even though a company like Amazon that has in four years struggled to have its device do one thing that is actually personal to me that resonates, they have accomplished step one, which is they do have the data. <laughs> you do have to have the data and you have to have the consumer or customer's willingness to share that data, right? Now you can make the argument that I'm playing it fast and loose, allowing these corporate devices to listen in on my environment. But the point is, I'm, I've allowed that to happen. So there's no hope to achieve personalization or whatever we call it, unless the opt-in data aspect happens, right? Because the data is, is fundamental to getting this right. Now. The big question is whether even if you have the data, can you do it, especially doing it in real time effectively? That to me is the question. What do you, what do you guys think of framing it that way? That's a good framing. And for what it's worth, I'm probably in the same boat as you are, John. Uh, I do not want to be personalized to that much. I think there's a, there's a class of consumer I, I haven't really defined them yet myself, but there's there's a people, I guess, like us, who want to find things themselves. You know, I want to do my own research. I'm not mm -hmm. just going to click what shows up in an ad. In fact, I'm less likely to trust something that shows up in an ad mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I've fallen into the that creepy level of personalization that we've been talking around right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other people, not so much. Um, but uh, according to a uh, Mc, uh, McKinsey study from, I don't remember when, I think might have been 2019, what personalization and hyper-personalization and giga-mega-micro-personalization does reduces acquisition costs. Maybe not for you and me, but in general, it can make it as much as 50% cheaper to get new customers kind of a big deal yep yeah giving the right information helps hmm. but yeah we want so, to give that information right so so just to make one quick distinction for our discussion today like from my point of view i i might object to the term hyper personalization but i don't object to the idea that some personalization strategies do work from a financial and business perspective yes. i don't disagree with that same here yeah. um yeah the the question becomes the overreach thing that I talked about at the end there. Like, I see businesses overreaching with these things all the time. That doesn't mean that they don't work. That's a huge distinction between the two, I think. Right. You, but we you do all... tend to look at the mistakes as being yes. that much more noticeable because of that. 
Yeah. Sorry for yeah. talking over you. No, no, that's fine. It's it's a free for all in here. Uh, Tracy's saying the number of scammers are so high that when they call and start asking questions, my walls go up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, it's hard to answer the phone these days. You just never know what you're going to get. Um, now, I asked you all to prepare a few do's and don'ts of personalization. And um, the way my show works, I like to try to start negative and then look for the positive. So when we think about the don'ts of personalization, I think we've covered that a lot. Did you have any others that you have prepared ahead of time, like don'ts for companies trying this that uh, that we haven't discussed? All of mine, basically. <laughs> no, <laughs> nearly all of mine, basically. Do you want to do you want to go through them, or are there any that we missed? Yeah, we can just briefly go through them. So I'm a bit bit more geekier than you right now. So oh, I'm you geekier. went fancy. All right, I went I went fancy. Let's have a look at the first one. So first one, I think we had to is transition and everything. <laughs> this guy knows his shit. I love this. Oh, yeah. Wow, uh -huh. Thomas, well, you are uh, classing uh, it up. This is awesome. Boys and their toys. Eh? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So I think they are often asking for too much too soon. So which doesn't help them in getting the right piece of information that helps them serving me information that helps me solving my issue at hand because I sure as hell don't give them what they what is appropriate and right. What would be an example of asking for too much too soon just for context? I mean, I suppose it varies by individual, but what would be an example? Yeah. So the the, ver the easiest for all of us in our industry is some some sign up pages, yeah, or some download barriers. Ah, uh, yeah. When when they are asking a gazillion pieces of information that, right, I'm not willing to give, and guess what? They get bogus. Yeah. yeah. All on. B2C pretty much the same. Yeah? So they are asking for all sorts of my preferences in the first contact right. that I don't care to give them. So they won't. Which goes against how humans build relationships, which is by sharing right, yeah. information gradually is the relationship yeah. deepens. I like that one. Okay. What's your next one? Yeah. The next one would be, so let's just stay here on that one. The, the next one would be they are confusing value, uh, value for themselves with what is of value for me. So this is something that ticks me off. So, well, you want to, you want to sell this bloody mic. So uh, nice. This is valuable for you, but not necessarily for me because I might have already chosen another one. So th there are some change in the thought process needs to happen. Coming to that probably a bit later. The yes. third one is, and th that one really ticks me off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I had one example of that today and one a bit earlier. So I get briefly into both. So the, the one few days earlier when getting to their site was a European, a Swiss company. They popped up this meanwhile mandatory <laughs> data pop up. Say, okay, so we are selling your data. And you can't contradict. What you can do is, in brackets, so this is now pretty much in quotes, you can research the email address that we want you to send the contradiction email to. Oh, boy. So what the, what the, yeah, right, what the, <laughs> was my thought. So, uh, of course, yeah. I researched that and replied pretty much instantly. So, uh, you can't do that. That ticks off your customers. And the other one was, uh, well, was basically today. <laughs> they, they, basically say we collect and we don't give you the choice, which in Europe for EU customers like me or mm -hmm. EU persons like me, even if I'm residing in the US is illegal. Plain as it's just illegal. Did you call the police? No, <laughs> that would have been awesome. But, 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 but my I, name but is, I my name is Thomas <laughs> Swoobernet. I'd, I'd like to report a crime. Yeah, yeah. There, there, yeah. there is a there is a dedicated um, inbox for that one. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. Well, what it's I did is I trash. informed. The, I, I I called. <laughs> the, no, no, it's, it's actually working. So I informed the vendor. Yeah, so well, this 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 can't really can't be done. Right. And the 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 fourth one goes into 
basically it again so it's, they collect for collection's sake right this is the distinction between big data and smart data yeah, yeah. which comes pretty much into picture here these are my don't and those are good ones and technology those are good ones and thanks for the high-tech experience that was yeah, super, that was that was, that was most excellent that will work really nice thing on replay as well yeah no, I'm, thank you I'm for impressed that. thank you I for do. that <laughs> while it's we're on the subject of any, any while we're on the subject of don'ts uh folks in the chat feel free to chime in on those those were really interesting marshall did we have any from you that we hadn't covered yet or did we get to them all um that covered most of them. There's one that uh, springs to mind that, again, it's very consumery, but it is important to consider, and that is things like stereotyping, where mm -hmm. you know you are targeting ads to someone based on something else that they have done or looked at or bought that they do not necessarily want to be associated with. For example, um, I am not a thin person. Even when I was in good shape, I was not a thin person. Uh, so I tend to buy larger sizes. If after buying something in a larger size, I start getting ads for gym memberships and weight loss <laughs> programs, mm. I'm going to be a little pissed off. Right. Because mm -hmm. you are making assumptions about me that you do not need to make as a business to get me to pay attention to you. In fact, you might be insulting me. You know, that goes beyond being mm -hmm. irrelevant and to, be, to being inappropriately personal and mm -hmm. for the wrong reasons. You know, it's mm -hmm. badly mistargeted, even though the data points you in the right direction. But other than that, yeah, I'm with Thomas. He mentioned, um, you know, the irrelevance, the uh, excessive retargeting is a big problem. And I'll tell you, oh, we would never sell your data. Sure, but we'll give it away to anybody who asks. I've run mm -hmm. into that myself. And that just ain't cool. The big problem, uh, another big problem is getting the balance right and i guess that isn't really a do or a don't but it's you know finding finding the liminal the limit because the best personalization is the kind that you don't quite notice it's when it looks like it's a coincidence you know i was you know just looking at something the other day and oh here's an ad for it or even better yet here's an article about that topic mm -hmm. you know and that makes you want to look what doesn't work as well is when you browse a particular topic or click on an ad and then you get you know the torrent of 30 other competing ads mm. as i said uh earlier in the show you know, you buy one couch and are offered 10. Yeah. Uh, uh, makes a point. Irrit yeah. makes a lot Sorry. of good points. We should Let probably just, invite her. Lot, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to read this. Maybe don't necessarily assume that the data you have is correct and verify before using the data, which potentially will make it less creepy. Irrit, I want to make one clarification there, which is for me, what you're describing Actually, what feels creepy is what I described earlier, at least to me, which is when I'm shown something that is very accurate, but it feels like someone's basically been spying on me and tracking my every movement. Like like the extreme version is kind of like, hey, John, are you hungry right now? We know you're in a hotel room alone. You know, you want to order pizza? Like, <laughs> like that's a little too much for me. So so that's really accurate, but that's creepy. What I think you're referring to, Irit, I, I, I call tone deaf. Which, yeah. t which to me is, is not creepy, but it's almost equally offensive, right? Which is that feeling of like, you, you, your data on me is just wrong or, or to Marshall's point, even offensive, right? Like that you're, yeah. you're, you're leaping to conclusions. So I think you make a really good point. It's just a matter of, I think how we experience the misuse of data could vary a lot uh, depending on how it's misused. 
I want to ask these guys a little... Oh, sorry, Thomas, go ahead. Data might very well be correct, accurate even, just that the conclusions, the reasons for... Well, well, the reasons why this data is correct, taking Marshall as the example, well, he is a big guy. Yeah. But that might not be because he is just a lazy bones and sitting on his right. chair doing office stuff the whole day, but might have be might have totally different reasons. Right. Yeah. So uh, there was a guy who was, was this, I don't know if it was one of the front runners of the All Blacks. Well, superior fit guy, right? 130, 140 kilograms of muscle. Well, he got weight loss. At. <laughs> yeah, most it, yeah. it's weird. A lot of professional athletes, yeah. if you yeah. you know, judge them yeah. by BMI, are yeah. obese. Fat, uh, obese, and that's yeah. a big yeah. lie. They got yeah. no fat on them at all, but yeah. the numbers. Well, he might have needed to lose a half kilogram. You never know. Oh um, no! But um, <laughs> so so I want to discuss one more thing, um, which I've written about on Diginomica, and I plan to return to because it's something I feel really strongly about, which is what I juxtapose as like the the wrong-headed AI artificial intelligence approach to personalization versus the classic approach that works, which is super user configuration. To just to give you one uh, one example of that, the most personal experience in my home is asking my Amazon devices to to initiate routines, which play random play different genres of Spotify playlists that I have painstakingly constructed myself. That is extremely personal, but it's because I was empowered to create and configure that. Now, what companies don't like about this is because a lot of consumers don't have the time or interest in getting under the hood and configuring 10,000 song playlists and, you know, <laughs> and, setting, and setting up routines on their device because the routines don't happen. You have to configure them, right? Mm. And so what companies want to do is they want to take that away and let AI take care of that for us. And a, and a classic example of that, and there are many, but I can just give you... If you're a super user type like me, your features are always being taken away, especially on the big free services, right? You look like the fall of Google Reader is just one of many examples. But one that I will point to is Netflix. I spent really an, a, a, a ridiculous and almost absurd amount of time configuring my list of things I wanted to watch, which I had organized by genre and various things. And Netflix eradicated that in favor of an AI driven <laughs> list. Well, they know um, better than you. So <laughs> they do. They think they know better. My Netflix viewing has gone down about 90% because Netflix is actually pretty good at showing me stuff that I might be interested in, but my list was my thing. That was my one spot on Netflix where I got to control what I saw and order it in such a way that engaged me. They thought their AI could do that better than I could. And it it's can't. like they're telling you you were wrong. This isn't what you like. We know what right. you like. <laughs> and, and look, AI is a powerful player in personalization. I'm not going to say that it's not. But there are limits between recommending things I might watch mm. versus reordering my freaking list. Yeah. Oh, for real? And, I and so, so, so here's two other points I want to make about this, and I'll turn it over to you all to riff on this. One is that Netflix and Google and consumer tech companies can get away with this because they deal in aggregate and, and a handful of fussy super users like me, oh, I'm so mad, I'm going to quit. They don't care about that. I mean, I'd like to take credit for Netflix's current struggles, but it has more to do with other things. <laughs> um, enterprises, I would argue, have to be more careful with this because some of the people that are most super user oriented in enterprises are actually pretty influential. They're not necessarily always budget holders, but they're often subject matter experts that influence budget holders. So in the B2B world, we have to be a little more careful about alienating super user type people. Um, so, so that's an interesting point. But then the next point is, to what extent can AI actually help people who don't have the time 
to configure elaborate things to kind of guide them through it a little bit. And I think that is some interesting uncharted territory for personalization around like maybe asking me a few questions and then constructing some things based on those answers. And so to me, that could be a little bit of a consumer solution to that versus, because I know that I'm in the minority as far as being this like super user geek that likes to configure things like that. So anyway, let's hear your comments. Well, maybe not a complete minority. Um, the next bit that I'm going to go through, is, I have to say, is not original research on my part. But while I was doing research for the show, I ran across an article by uh, Preeti Kotamarthi, who was writing for Decision Lab, uh, talking about literally the do's and don'ts of personalization. And well, she quoted a couple of numbers, um, and you mentioned Netflix. She said 75% of content watched on Netflix is based on the platform's recommendations. Uh, similarly, 50% mm. of listening time on mm. Spotify comes from personalized playlists created using technologies like that. Mm -hmm. YouTube videos, 70% of time, they're coming from uh, AI-based recommendations. Amazon, 35% of products are recommended by the algorithm. And yes, I did just read that pretty much straight from the article. I apologize, but they're absolutely... No, that's great. Yeah, I'm, pasting, I'm pasting it into the chat. Most of our destinations will see the link. <laughs> yeah. If not, you can search based on the article yeah. title. Yeah. That, that spot on. Yeah, it, it is. This is personal. The do's and don'ts mm -hmm. of personalization mm -hmm. in tech is the actual title of the article. And all of the things that are mentioned are things that mm, sorry having trouble with words today the way the reason they work so well is the super user issue these are cases where the user wants the personalization there is going to be back and forth there is going to be fine tuning of that personalization where it doesn't work is where businesses try to slide into someone else's personalization trying to capture people who may not who are on the fringes of a particular market and fail that's where we notice mm -hmm. it's where the friction is i i will say that youtube in particular i would call out as as a high point in this i mean they are they are amazing to me now they don't try to force me to watch one thing, but if I load up the full screen, there's going to be some stuff on there that I'm interested in. I mean, they, they, they nail it. And, and they don't overreach in the sense that they don't try to force me to watch one thing. They show me a bunch of stuff, and they always have something on there, like always. And the recommended stuff is always like right there. They, they can, they're very sticky from that vantage point. I think they're about, in my opinion, they're about the best in the business for that kind of thing. Eric's got a question for you all. Would you see the use of intent data and then approaching people with subjects related to those intent subjects as a personalization if you add some specific business info or still as an, or is it an automated config? Just leave it up. So I think that is personalization oh, okay. because we are, we are coming from my intent, right? My I took it down because it's intent. covering your face, yeah. but... Like no, you're not missing much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll switch this for a sec so we so, can see your face while you read it. <laughs> so, uh, so they are using my current behavior to derive an intent and create an action out of that that reacts to this intent. This, in my eyes, is, well, if it's fitting, <laughs> the perfect way for personalization you're using in moment data you're using contextual data to provide me something right now if you do it right now and not two days later brian's had his paradigm shift i think he <laughs> says i think you guys should examine the recommendation problems i encounter as most sites assume i want more stuff like the gifts i bought for my dad mom I'm getting some of the most pointless irrelevant suggestions possible 
Brian, that's what happens when you come to the show late. I think we spent the first 20 minutes talking yeah. about awkward pregnancy gifts and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is, this is one is, that I well, run into. Yeah. It's well trodden territory, but, but yeah. to the point, to the point, it does, it does hurt. I think it hurts brand loyalty and perception. And I understand why Brian gets frustrated with it. Yeah. yeah I don't know about anybody else, but sometimes, you know, when the, the ads for mother's day gifts or father's day gifts come in, I take them personally. And I know that I shouldn't. You know, it's like, you know, here's a holiday coming along, but neither of my parents are among the living anymore. And I see the, you know, get flowers for mom or, you know, buy a tie for dad because everyone buys ties for dad on Father's Day. And I go, really? Really? You're giving me this ad? Fuck you. I don't need this. And there's no way to screen them out. (laughs) You know, you can't screen them out. That's. Those are going to be in the broadest level of advertising there is. That's not a matter of personalization. In fact, what would be great personalization is the ability to opt out of those globally. It would certainly make me a much nicer person and less likely to say fuck you on a broadcast. There you go. Fortunately, on my show, we allow it. (laughs) Until I get kicked off some site because of it, but it's all good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to flag over 18 on YouTube, and we should be. Yeah. Good job. It's not safe for work. I hope, I hope that YouTube doesn't show hyper-personalize our video to 16-year-olds anyway. So. Oh, um, but by the way, the just, most effective personalized ad I ever saw. Mark. It's adult content. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The most effective personalized ad, this isn't true personalization like we're describing, but the most effective, my favorite of all time, and it comes up because I got to go to Orlando for a couple shows this fall, and I'm dreading it because it's my least favorite destination. Ooh, On the yeah. way back from the airport one year, there was a huge billboard for vasectomy.com. And I was thinking, like, <laughs> this is absolute genius because, like, you got the, you know, heading to Orlando, it's all fun and excitement, but on the way back, the kids are sleep deprived. They're going through sugar withdrawal. They're crying and screaming. <laughs> and you're crammed up in a minivan. And you look up and there's an ad for vasectomy.com and it's like, yes, no more. That is We're bloody stopped. brilliant. Yeah, Too late. I just absolutely, <laughs> I loved it. I wish more marketers put that kind of thought into like how to intersect because that was just perfect for me. But, um, but I... I we can't talk forever, and there's so much more we could talk about. But I do want to make sure that each of you gets a uh, chance to share a little bit more because we we got into a lot of don'ts. Like even though Brian wanted us to like get into even more don'ts, <laughs> we got into a lot of don'ts. Can we can we get a little more into things that you see that are working? And I don't care if it's AI or just other techniques that you like. What, what's what do you think is working in this area of personalization that we haven't covered? Marshall. I started the other one. <laughs> yeah, you're up, Marshall. You're on the hot seat. Okay. Um, what works best, um, I think, would be when you're able to match personality of an ad to the person who's reading it. For example, what we just did with vasectomies. You know, if you know, when you are able to present something to someone that gets to not only something that they're interested in, but to the way that they think, to their sense of humor or to their worldview. Doing that is, it's incredibly powerful because what we have been saying for years and years is people are more likely to trust a business that they think gets them. That understands their values. And if you can present that sort of persona and offer that to a customer, it's going to be huge. That's a big do, Mm -hmm. is understand not just what they want, but why they want it and how they're thinking about it. It's difficult. I'm not going to say otherwise. It requires some back and forth and some research beyond the direct relationship you know you, you've got to infer some things and look at what else that individual is doing around the electronic world but when you can get it mm-hmm. it is 
powerful. That's one. Um, the same thing with things like goals and attitudes. Just anything that goes beyond the transactional, you know, beyond what is interesting in the moment. You know, it can't just be about the product or the service. If you can batch what you are offering to something that resonates with another part of the individual, then you are much more likely to make a sale, to get a loyal customer, or just to get them talking about it. You say, this was a really great ad. Um, I don't know that when you were on your way back from Orlando, you decided, hey, I'm going to go get a vasectomy. Mm. But you just talked about it with not only us, but with the audience. We're going to think about that and probably share that story. You did their job for them because right. it got into mm. your head. And that's what you have to do. Get into the head. Good. Thomas, did we miss any of your dues? Yeah, I, I know you have some high tech stuff again. Slight, slightly different. And of course, I now Come on. geek out again. The German geek efficiency. Again. <laughs> yeah. So the, the first one is, and that is similar to what, what Marshall just said, is you need to build trust. Trust and maintain mm. it, nurture it. So there are various facets to it, and some of them Marshall just brought forward. But it's, I would look like it as a, it's a credit that I extend to business. I, customer, extend to a business. And, well, it's withdrawn pretty fast, as we have seen in the last financial crisis, where the banks withdrew their credit lines. <laughs> so, and, and once it's gone, it's gone. This is what I think it was Tracy like. So you're on my no buy from list now. Yeah. yeah. So if, if I don't have trust anymore. So related to that, but different, you need to think outside in. So it's not about what you want to sell me, but because about what my issue at hand is, what my intention right now is, and then offer some value towards solving this issue. This might be a product of yours. Might just also be a piece of information. And it might point to a competitor even. And if, if you're doing that, then you're on my trust list. So yeah. say, hey, I've got a bunch of great products, but what you actually want is that. So and third one, there I well, could have gone on for ages with, with points, but the third one goes into the, te uh, the technology mm -hmm. area and the organizational area. So what needs to be done in order to achieve all this, to make personalization work, is you need to break silos. This is data silos, this is process silos, this is organizational silos. So after all, what, what this is, is all data driven. It's data and process driven. And in order to the process, for the processes to work, the data needs to be available and accurate, of course. And then we are back to the trust. So, and then it needs to be shared. So that it's not only about marketing, but also about the service. It's all information that goes in that is relevant at this time to help me. These are my points. Uh, there's one thing I would like to bring up that I mm. think we've missed, um, and that is. I've already forgotten how I wanted to say it, uh, but it has to do with breaking down the silos. Um, the regulatory environment that we live in now is different. Yeah. You know, I'll just mention the regulations and hopefully people will understand what I'm talking about. GDPR, CCPA. It is a lot harder for marketers to do the things that we're talking about them doing when third-party cookies are going away, when customers are, in theory, being given better control of their personal data. What needs to be done, you have to make them 
want to give you that information. And that relates back to what Thomas said about trust. It's not something that you get in one big block when you meet for the first time. It's something that grows over the course of a relationship, just like with people to other people. And yeah, I there is no one solution to it. But in the data environment we're in now, you have to be very circumspect about how and when you collect each part of data. In fact, I saw an ad today, just today, from uh, Norton, the, the antivirus people, for their Norton 360 product with LifeLock. And, well, I'm not going to go through the whole ad, but they were doing things like showing people saying, hmm, the online yoga program needs information on my tax returns. You know, why do they, they don't need that. Or, uh, yeah, they, uh, this mobile game wants my social security number to unlock the next level of stars. And people just share that information. Those days are gone. But the, and there are products protecting people from their own stupidness. Stupidity, that's the word. Hmm, English. You'd think I grew up speaking it. Hmm. But that is, that is another issue. Uh, breaking down silos is difficult when we are making thicker walls at the same time. It requires a different approach. Yeah, those are really good points as we wrap. Uh, those of you who are with us in the chat, if you have final comments or questions, please get them in now. You have kept things lively, as I was hoping, counting on you to do, so thank you for that. You know who you are, but I really appreciate you being here. Uh, just, I did want to comment a little bit on this, on this issue of trust, because I think you did a great job hitting on that. And to me... Companies could do much more around transparency, around how they use your data and yes. allowing you to opt in and opt out. It bothers me a little bit when the consumer companies show me that because I can always tell they're doing it because they were required by law to do it. <laughs> yes. it, it, never feel, it never feels like, hey, we're voluntarily wanting to build trust with you. It always feels like, hey, we're covering our ass. We have to show you this thing as a one-time pop-up. And yeah, like in the my safe harbor statement. And and I think SaaS companies in the in the enterprise space need to take a page here as well because they are very dependent on opt-in data in a variety of ways, including mm. aggregate data that becomes very important not only for their own stats but also to share with customers around trends and metrics. So we're going to see a lot more of that. I'd like to actually see now that shows are back. By the way, you may want to. Check out my scorching post on Diginomica about hybrid events, but that's another topic. Uh, but now that now that shows are back in person, I'd like to see a booth where you could come and talk to uh, the vendor about how they're using your data, and even allow you to opt out or opt into certain things on prem on, on, on site at a conference. Like, let's do this. Like, let's have conversations around how we use your data. Let's be very open about it. Like, to me, that's a big part of trust is openness and volunteering that stuff. If I have to chase you down to find that stuff out, it's not reassuring to me. So to me, like, that's a big part of this personalization thing that you guys hit on is let's earn trust the right way by, by, by creating relationships where I continue to share more and more data because of the value you're delivering and because I'm confident in how you're going to use it. And to Thomas's point, I know you're not going to sell it off on the back end or whatever else. So that's my little rant. It's a good rant. It's a mm, solid rant. Excellent. <laughs> I'm happy to be part of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, so we have no further comments from the chat. Oh, I have something in the private chat, though. Let's see what... Oh, yeah, about the... Marshall, you posted something around the legal stuff. Is there anything more you want to say about the legality of personalization? <laughs> Sorry to reveal your private comment. I guess ah, I, I lost uh, some of the trust that we built up. You've missed the entire point of this episode, haven't you, John? Oh, man, I'm going to have to watch it again <laughs> after we wrap. Uh, no, I'm good. I just I feel like it's something that we should have mentioned earlier on because it is both a barrier and an opportunity. You know, it is more difficult 
to just grab customer data and run with it because they can take it back from you at any time. And there are certain things that you cannot collect and certain ways that you cannot track it. This is important to know. However, there is also a greater degree of openness because you can actually talk about what is being collected and how to take it down. You know, one of the best ways to make sure that uh, there is equality in uh, pay in the office is to make sure that everyone can talk about how much they're being paid. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's, you know, a comparison. Mm-hmm. This is the same thing. In Germany, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. And very much the same way, the way to make sure that data is being handled on the up and up is to talk about what's being collected, where it's going, uh, who gets to see it, and how we get to take it back. And if there are laws that make businesses abide by certain standards, well, good, because you should not have unregulated businesses. Ryan brings up a really good one. Uh, I'm going to throw that, throw this one right in the worst practice column. How about vendors? <laughs> how about vendors putting Beacon Tech on conference ID badges? One notified this week that they'd be doing it. Brian, I would say unless there's an opt out, uh, that's a complete fail. I think that's actually repugnant and yeah. and potentially punitive in some cases. Whereas there are some interesting use cases around it. For example, optimizing yep. the food flow. But right. that's really opt in as long as it's yeah. opt in yeah. and opt out, then I'm I have no yeah. problem with it. Yeah. Brian, is there an opt out? Let us know. If it's, there's no opt out, I would say that's a I would call that a work worse practice. Tracy talks about how a lot of SaaS people go to insert conference here to get the attendee list. Yeah, true, Tracy, and there's still a whole big thing around that where Mm. When you go to a show, even today, you kind of brace yourself when you get home. You know, you, not only do you take your COVID home test, you, 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 you worry about what you're going to get in your inbox from all these vendors. It, it was, I'm sorry, we weren't able to catch up or whatever. It's like, what the hell? There's a reason why we didn't catch up. We had no appointment. You just grabbed my name from the, from the list. Now you're spamming me. Like, that's why we didn't catch up. It's like, that was intentional on my part. Um. Tracy's not a fan of the beacons. Um, just so you know, you will never have to wear a beacon to watch my show. Um, deal breaker says Tracy. Yeah, I mean that's that's rough. I mean that's but but to Thomas's point, there's an upside there for those who want to participate in something like that. And 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 I think to me, this kind of gets at the heart of the final point Marshall's making, which is that the legality and can stop some of the black hat behavior, but I don't know that it ensures that we get good results. It kind of stops the bad shit, but it may not get us to the good stuff. So there's, I think, two parts of this that we have to reckon with. Yeah, there's carrot and there's stick. The the laws are the stick, but we also need to make cases where we want to have that kind of interaction. You know, show us that we're actually getting something for what we give to the business and not just a 10% off coupon. Mm-hmm. You, know, it's, you know, Thomas was saying things of that nature. John, you were saying things of that nature, I think. You know, we were all talking around this. Uh, make it worth the customer's time and make mm-hmm. it worth exposing a little bit of their information about their life to you. Make it really worth it to them. Make them want to do it, not just feel like yeah. they should. There you go. Oh, and one of my favorite lost, yeah. examples is TripIt. I willingly share with TripIt, which is owned by Concur, which is owned by SAP, which lets me to say, as an SAP customer, I'm outraged about this or that, which is really funny. I've done that before. Uh, but uh, not exactly an enterprise-grade customer, but... <laughs> so I, you know, I upload all my trips, right? But in exchange, I get all these alerts on, you know, flight delays and everything else, and mm. save my bacon once save me from getting stuck in Canada with the wrong visa. So, you know, I think that's that's an example, Marshall, of like where the trust is earned, and you give the data, and you get a result. And if personalization always worked like that, 
I wouldn't even have to mock it at all. Brian says here there was an opt-out, but I really don't know if they need to know when I eat, which bathroom I use when I ducked out to take a call. This is the trade show beacon follow-up from Brian. So, yeah, I hear you, Brian. It's a little awkward when you have to go take a call with the competitor of that vendor and you're in your hotel room and they know it because they've got the beacon going. I hope it doesn't have sound recorder on it, too. It could be worse. <laughs> well, they wouldn't uh, tell you if it did. You know Alex is listening to you right now, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny, too, because I'll, I'll come home after a trip and I'll say to my Amazon devices, it's good to be home. And you know what I get back? Welcome. Sorry, I don't know that. <laughs> well, there's Not, a reason why there is no. I'm Alexa sorry, Dave. In my house, I don't. I, can't do, will, yeah. I don't. Will I don't exactly enough. feel particularly welcome at that point um, in my own home. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be back. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know that. I'm like, open don't. the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm Get sorry, a Dave. Dog. Get a I'm pop. afraid I can't do that. This pop comes and is happy when you're yeah. entering your house <laughs> well i have to settle for house plants right now but my house plants definitely appreciate when i'm home more than my amazon devices so <laughs> so guys uh, any any final comments that you wanted to make short final comments it was fun <laughs> yeah i had a good time with this i hope yeah. that we added more signal than noise to your audience and let's do it again sometime. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just Definitely. to briefly summarize for everyone, I'm going to give you my view and see if these two agree. Uh, my my view is that that we have some level of consensus that whatever you might want to call this is personalization uh, can be powerful if applied properly with trust and all these other things. Um, I think we've also got a general agreement that hyper personalization may not even be a necessary term. Uh, I think we've really flagged that. We've really raised the question whether we need to use this word, which really makes gives me a lot of joy. Um, and if hyper-personalization is off the table, then ultra-personalization is absolutely unacceptable <laughs> at this it's time. <laughs> yeah. or, or what did you quote yeah. that other one from the analyst firm? Giga on a personal... There's some other kind of weird personalization. Anyway, that's uh, off the table, geez. too. Yeah. <laughs> We could stick to personalization. But. Yeah, personalization is good enough. Eventually, I'll probably enough. have have you guys back around in some configuration. Thomas and I have been debating the metaverse and exploring use cases. I just got my Oculus headset gear yeah. here because I feel I need to wear it to criticize it. <laughs> yeah. I keep on so. thinking I should do that, and then I realize, no, I don't want to. <laughs> anyway i guess i should get over that so thanks all for joining us uh th this show will come back on on friday afternoons however i'm heading for another show hiatus the last one was caused by by covid so you can blame the pandemic but i will be back folks i will rise again and it's great to have you all here thanks to my wonderful guests for all the homework you put in ahead of time to make this a great show today thank you thanks for bye everyone it's been a pleasure bye <laughs>